Thank you, everyone. Um, again, sorry to not be in person. Um, though I am day seven of COVID, I'm still testing positive. So just want to be safe for everybody. And um, it's funny because I kind of got used to being in person again. And it's interesting to, um, yeah, to like feel that that transition and that shift. It's nice to be able to see the online people so clearly. Um, so, you know, silver linings there. And want to just again, welcome everyone to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Welcome, you are the San Francisco Dharma Collective, even if this is your very first night. Um, and just to remind all of us, whether again, it's our first time or many times, this is an entirely volunteer run center. It's so interesting. There are many of you like myself who are longtime San Franciscans and having a completely volunteer run Dharma center would not have been strange 10 years ago or 20 years ago. But these days in San Francisco to have something that is volunteer run um, that you can attend and be part of without contributing anything monetarily. It's not just awesome, it's radical. And that we create a radical shared space together is really um, a source of a lot of comfort for me. And it's messy, right? When things are done in a volunteer way, it means that everyone is working together to figure it out. So I want to say at the very top here that we're doing our very best to figure it out and make it work. Includes our tech issues, our, includes our, um, you know, desire to just make a place where folks can feel they show up um, fully as themselves and can be heard. So one thing I always like to mention is that the values we really uphold here are a lot of the same values as the paramitas, generosity and patience, joyful enthusiasm to treat, you know, our entire practice of being here together as your dharma. Uh, this is especially relevant for our theme tonight Man, I have tried to avoid the chapter we're on in this book. Like, I just, I was like, is there a way that Chandra can do this? Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to do this one. And of course, through the roulette, it is mine. Um, we have been working our way through this book for the last <clears throat> number of months. We are in the last two chapters now, in the last part here. And this evening, we will do a practice together of meditation, and we will go through the theme. The theme of this chapter, it'll actually take more than one night, so I think Chandra will get a turn at it. Uh, the chapter tonight is called um, Exposing Faults. Yeah, like really, I think we're good. Aren't there enough faults? Aren't they uh, extremely exposed by myself and my own mind, by others, right? Uh, but we will get into that material. I've, I've come around to it over these weeks of trying to avoid it. Um, so we'll get into that rich material together. But I thought it would be really great to just give ourselves this time to settle in. Um, myself, and it sounds also like Daniel here online in being going through this um, this COVID journey, which um, for a lot of uh, aspects of it, I've been super fortunate. It's the first time I've gotten it. I had everything I needed. I had friends and community to support me. Um, still, it's it's been quite hard, and and one of the hardest parts for me was the first three days I couldn't practice at all. And I just felt really, um, yeah, just really kind of underwater with the physical pain with the body. So I thought it would be worthwhile for us to, especially as we are in this chapter of the book, which is the fourth part of the book. We're making our way towards enlightenment. If you haven't noticed, we've been building up and now we're almost there. And in this last kind of chapter or part of the book, I think it's really meaningful to come back to the very essence or the beginning of the book. And that's really focusing on the four contemplations. So we'll begin our meditation reflecting on those four contemplations, which really help us kind of situate and um, prioritize practice, honestly. I think when we have these four contemplations in the beginning of our practice, 
it's reminding ourselves why we've put everything down. It's encouraging us to kind of further let go anything that might come up in the mind to distract us and a guide for us to what will really lead to the liberation that we seek, the sense of contentment moment to moment and breath to breath. So without further preamble, let's go ahead and find a comfortable position where we can sit and practice together with our body feeling at ease, relaxed, and also upright. As we take these first couple breaths of practice together, see if there's a way you can adjust your posture to even more fully support you in that sense of ease and relaxation, as well as vividness. This might mean straightening up through the spine. This might mean leaning a little forward or back, finding just the right posture. And as we ease into the practice, let's begin relaxing and releasing through the muscles in the face. Noticing the sensations through the forehead and between the eyebrows. And then with the next exhale, relaxing and releasing any tension in this area. Alighting our attention now around the eyes, the upper and lower eyelids. And again, with an exhale, relaxing and releasing any strain or tension, heaviness through the eyes. Resting the attention now to the cheekbones and the jaw, and to the lips, even the teeth and tongue resting in the mouth. And again, noticing through the exhale any tension or tightness and inviting a full relaxation, a release, a surrender. And continue noticing areas around the neck and shoulders or chest. Inhabiting the sensations of our body with our attention and awareness. And through our exhale, gently release. Continuing noticing sensations through the shoulders, the biceps, the forearms, the fingers and the palms. And with our exhale, allow this tension to completely release as though draining out of these limbs.
Inviting our attention and awareness now to the belly, the lower back and sacrum. And then imagine hooking any attention we find here. And with the exhale, relaxing, releasing. Bringing our attention to the shoulder blades and down the back, through the buttocks, through both thighs and kneecaps, calves, shins, top of the feet, soles of the feet, into the toes. Noticing the sensations here. And with our exhale, relaxing, releasing, surrendering any tension, strain or heaviness. And with some slow breaths, we'll use our inhale to bring our attention from the tips of our toes all the way up to the crown of our head. Then on our exhale, relax and release from the crown of the head through the tips of the toes. Twice more, slowly inhale, bringing our attention from the toes all the way to the crown. And then exhale, as though washing it, releasing it. And a couple more times, inviting this full embodied attention through the inhale and then a full embodied release in the exhale. Now that we've established some presence of attention and awareness in the body, we'll move to this practice of four remembrances. I'll say each phrase and we'll simply notice, allow the words to impact the body, heart, mind. Maybe noticing if certain images or ideas arise maybe thoughts or feelings. Whatever occurs is perfectly fine. Simply witnessing and observing the impact of these words. Their goal is to help us shift our mind towards what is wholesome and help us incline our mind away from what no longer serves us.
the first of these remembrances is to remember the preciousness of this human life. The second of these remembrances is to remember that every single thing is impermanent. Every experience, every event, every beloved has a beginning and an end. With these remembrances, it's almost as though we are dropping a stone into the pond. And just noticing how the ripples radiate out, impacting our heart, mind, and body. The third of these remembrances is to remember that everything has a cause and an effect. Each small thing we do and each large thing we do matters day to day, week to week, year to year. And the fourth remembrance is to remember that dedicating our lives to avoiding the experience of pain and suffering while seeking to hold on to pleasure and joy does not create lasting contentment.
with these reflections on the preciousness of this moment of being alive, the reality of impermanence, the law of cause and effect, the unsatisfactoriness of samsara. We can polish our inner lens and consider what is our intention for being here. Whether this is an intention that's familiar, a guiding light, or something that just appeared this evening. Feel as though you're holding it like a treasure within the heart-mind, letting it illuminate and glow. And feel or imagine this glow just gently receding to the edges. And we'll shift now to a practice of self-compassion. Considering something that is going on in life right now that feels hard. Something where maybe we feel we're falling short. Maybe there's a, a fault or a mistake or an error we, we seem to keep making. This could be a habit. This could be a way of seeing or approaching. This could be something we're avoiding. See if you can choose one thing that feels as though it's hard to be with, ignites self-criticism or feelings of insufficiency. And as you bring this to mind, Notice how it may shift and change in the body. Maybe your brows start to get tighter together. Maybe the jaw clenches. Maybe the temperature changes in your body altogether, warmer or cooler in certain areas. as you bring this challenging part of yourself to mind. Do you notice a shift in how you're thinking, feeling? Is it a feeling of frustration, sadness, maybe shame? The first part of this practice is bringing our mindful awareness to this experience, this challenge or difficulty that we're facing and working with. For a couple more moments, just honestly seeing, being with this challenge or difficulty. 
as much as possible, not adding any more to the discursive mind of why it's this way and how it should be. Just noticing the impact on the body. Noticing the impact on the thoughts. Not experiencing this as sensation and feeling. Not getting caught up in the story. And then shifting our mind and heart and attention to considering that whatever is this issue or challenge we're having, that we're not alone. Not only is every other person we're practicing with right now working with a challenge, every single being has struggles and difficulties, maybe some very close to, or just like our own. And for a couple moments, allow this non-separateness, this common humanity to ventilate the heart. Notice if there's even some tenderness, recognizing that this struggle is not only yours. All of us have a struggle together. And from that place of shared challenge and difficulty, shift again to considering what might be uniquely useful for you and being able to soothe and care for yourself. Maybe there is a specific word or phrase like, I love you, or this will pass. It could be helpful to put a palm on the heart or a hand even around an opposite shoulder like an embrace. And see if there's a word or a phrase, maybe a line of poetry or a lyric from a song. Something that feels soothing to be with this challenge and difficulty. Something maybe your best friend would say to you. Repeat this word or phrase a couple more times. And gently release the hand if it's been touching the heart or the shoulder. Release the words. And allow your attention and awareness to just simply rest 
maybe noticing <clears throat> the breath or the sensations in the body. Maybe simply feeling spacious and open. Thank you for your practice. So any <clears throat> questions or reflections on that practice? We did a, a double header, a little bit of our four remembrances to get us started and then some Self-compassion to get us ready to expose our faults together. How were the four remembrances for folks? Does that, <clears throat> I feel like they're a bit sobering, um, but I really love the idea of practicing with them and not making them just kind of these things we read and we know cognitively, but to actually sit with them in our body. Um, curious if anybody noticed a difference uh, going through one compared to the other, or if there's a cumulative effect of sitting with those phrases. I got something. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Jimmy. Thanks. It's like the magic of like some kind of air microphone in here. It's pretty <laughs> cool. Um, I'm going to go sit next to Pamela for a second. Okay. Um, <laughs> it was really nice to be reminded of those remembrances. I like the fact that I'm a human being. It's, you know, compared to some other life forms, it's, I, I kind of like it. Um, <laughs> and the fact that everything has a beginning and an end, 
That can be hard sometimes. Yeah. But it's really true. Hmm. And um, being able to actually live with that is um, it's a relief sometimes. Hmm. And to be reminded that every little thing has an impact. I mean, I'm responsible for my actions. And I'm responsible for the consequences of my actions. And I have to remember that they have an impact. Hmm. And that other people's actions have an impact on me. Um, and the, <laughs> that idea of, you know, I want life to be way more fun and way less painful than it actually is, that that's like a mugs game. And, you know, I mean, I'm constantly indulging in that but I have the cognitive awareness that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rigged game, man. I mean, you know, it's always gonna, there's always gonna be some, some, some suffering. Yeah. There's also always gonna be some joy. So, you know, it, 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 kind of, it, it goes both ways and, um, I'm slowly getting the message that chasing after one and avoiding the other is usually where I get into trouble. Yeah. And starting the meditation with those and then going into looking at the thing that is problematic for me in my life. That was, it, it was, it, Having that basis in the four remembrances first was gave me a good foundation and mm -hmm. allowed me to really look at what's not working in my life. So thank you, and I'm glad you're feeling better. Thank you. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah, I I think the it's interesting with the four remembrances. I, I really would be curious what it would be like to practice a full week or month with just one, you know, and really just kind of like that stone dropped, just notice the reverberations. Um, it's interesting because it's, it is ancient wisdom, right? To kind of prime us with these remembrances before we practice. But contemporary behavior change works very much the same, right? We, if we want to change our behavior, we have to remember our motivation and why we're doing this. It's like that really helps us get, get to the goods to keep persevering and do the task. So this is our, um, our little reminder, you know, and I think of living somewhere like Kathmandu or uh, other sacred sites in the world where the reminders of these things are everywhere. Like they're etched in the doorknobs. They're on top of the temples. Like you have these remembrances and these, um, it's just really beautiful to think of the different ways we can kind of invite them into our life. It, it could be the words and the practice. It could be, you know, a symbolic meaning for us that helps us remember and, um, the thing that's so interesting is, of course, uh, we remember and we forget. We remember and we forget. And we just remember and we forget. It's like we can only keep in mind what's immediately useful on a day-to-day -day basis for so long. And then it's so easy to forget. Um, so thinking of and getting creative with how we bring those into our life. Um, because, of course, there's so many ways we could connect our day-to-day -day experiences I was actually thinking how, especially looking at the relationship between cause and effect is, is a really good one for this chapter, exposing faults. It can really kind of 
help us um, look further. And also that it's really tough to not get pulled in and pulled under by samsara because there are some very real scary things um, and some very real enjoyable things that we don't want to let go of. So it's, it's very uh, tricky to not get hooked. Uh, very human, very normal. Yeah. Anybody uh, interested to share about the self-compassion practice, that three-step practice? I don't think we've done that together in a very long time. Yes, Claudia. I go on and share. Um, uh, my hey, sister-in-law uh, passed last week after mm -hmm. being in hospice for like nine months. And she was really brave. And, and uh, at the same time, even though it's been very painful, her passing, we were relieved because she was suffering too much. And so we felt like she was finally really literally resting in peace. But, but um, what I was gonna say is that even though we had periodic reunions cause she, she was in Napa and um, you know, we tried to keep in touch towards the end, I, and, and I used to do a lot of meditation, of course, knowing that her situation was terminal, it wasn't gonna get any better, but at least wishing that, you know, she, she didn't suffer as much. So I often did meditations of, this keeps me the name, the Pema Chodron, the, the blowing in, the yeah. Tonglen, Tonglen. Yeah. You know, I would do all these things, but towards the end, I stopped calling her or texting her and it was partly because I felt really awkward hmm. about like, I didn't know what to say. Yeah. Or, you know, I mean, like, how are you doing? Hello, well, duh, you know. And I mean, she had some good days and some days that were really hard, but I guess I've been feeling a little bit guilty if you want, or ashamed of not having had the courage. Hmm. Um, the strength to really be more in touch with her regardless. I, I feel like I, it's hard for me to do like small talk, Yeah. you know? So, so when we were doing the meditation, I thought about that and um, it just felt so good to have that self-compassion Eve because I, I almost envisioned her I literally envisioned her saying, it's okay, mm -hmm. it's okay, you know, you're, you're okay, I'm okay, it's fine. And the phrase that came to me was like, you're a good woman mm -hmm. and forgiveness, you know? So after I had that self-compassion, I, I really literally felt my heart like getting bigger. It was really nice, thank you. And I really needed to share this because it had been bothering me, you know? Um, yeah. And, but I just have to accept that. And that's who I am and who I was at the moment, you know? Yeah. So thank you. Beautiful, beautiful sharing with us. And I think it's, you know, it's a, it's, I love that you said forgiveness, you know, because compassion and forgiveness are just, they're the, they're the same, they're in the same river, right? Our ability to have that sense of um, real care and that aspiration to alleviate suffering is forgiveness too. And, um, you know, the complexity, I don't need to tell many of you on this call, the complexity of grief and all the emotions it brings up. Uh, and there is a, a common humanity in that feeling of guilt. Maybe it's for a different reason and a different thing, but it's very, it's very rich, you know, the whole um, different ways that we experience emotions of grief. 
and being able to allow them. Um, Claudia is very beautiful and allow and accept yourself. And I love what you said. That's who I was in that moment. I'm, and I'm a good woman. You know, and it's, yeah. And I think it's, you know, it's really interesting, this part, which I find uh, not usually instructed in that practice, but can be really powerful of, we have that whole bubbling up of our experience of what we're working with that's hard. Um, and there's a story, there's a, um, a description, like, ah, it was this, and I'm, but I'm not like that, da, 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 like whatever the specifics are. Um, and it can be such a kind of cognitive experience. We can stop and not be able to really access our, our felt, just the kind of, um, kind of feelingfulness without the story. And it can be such an important part of that alchemical process of shifting away from the story into the real compassion is to just feel the feeling, not the story, not the kind of headline of it, but just the feeling of it. And so hearing your voice and seeing your tears is a beautiful way to kind of connect to, to the feelingfulness there and, uh, and open. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're so not alone. Um, yeah, in many ways. Any other reflections on self-compassion before we move on to exposing your faults? Anything but exposing your faults, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanna, where we are in this book, I just kinda also wanna remember that, um, you know, I said it's four parts. And the first part of this book is turning the mind towards the spiritual path. Right, just that really kind of um, preliminary part, which is, I, I kind of want to start this book all over. I, I love these, the first part. The first part of the four remembrances, right? The precious human life and impermanence. And then the second part is the foundations of practice. Really thinking about the four measurables and um, how we uh, connect to those teachings at a deep level. And then the part three is the main path. And that's when we really get into view, meditation and action. And so with those first three parts, we're really kind of developing these tools and these qualities. And if you didn't, you know, if you haven't totally mastered all those, no problem, you can keep going back in the book, looking. But by part four, this exposing faults, it's removing the obstacles so that we can make progress on the path. And I think it's important we, we take that in mind when we look at this chapter on exposing faults and the teachings on exposing faults. So it's not just, all right, before I start meditating, let me think about everything that I'm doing wrong. Or this is an important part of my practice is really identifying and nitpicking what's wrong. Because it, it definitely, um, it feels a bit, tenuous or delicate to approach this subject. We have to have really established a sense of why we are practicing our motivation and really establish this sense of deep care for ourselves and others. We don't want to enter into this process without that. So I'll, I'll read a little bit <clears throat> from Mathieu Ricard. So for those who haven't seen this book, no problem. Uh, each chapter has excerpts from these kind of really accomplished Tibetan masters and a little bit of an intro by Matthew Ricard. So he writes here, the Kadampa masters used to say that the kindest teacher is one who reveals our hidden faults and thus enables us to see what is holding us back on the path. Reassuring flattery will only serve to sustain our ignorance, our vanity, our suffering. The rebukes of a true master, one whose sole purpose is to awaken his students, have nothing to do with contempt or a tendency to def defects in other behaviors. Just as the needle of the compass stubbornly and unambiguously points north, they provide their students with precious indications that will save them from wasting time, 
taking wrong directions or getting trapped in their own weaknesses. After reading some of the texts, one might think the authors are castigating themselves, but this expression of humility is traditional into presenting the teachings. The disciple knows how to take it. He understands that the teacher is showing him a mirror. Until we're able to integrate what we have understood through meditation in our everyday life, the smallest obstacle will trip us up and we'll be unable to cope with the vagaries of existence while continuing to grow spiritually. So the, I will sneak preview. I don't have a list of all of your faults to share with you. So sorry about that. You're going to have to do some of your own digging here. And, you know, it, it, it is pretty rare for most of us in the contemporary um, way that we're receiving these teachings to have a teacher who could and would do that, right? Really help us expose our faults. That's a, it's, you could say maybe a lost art, um, or you could say we're needing to update for these times. Many of us uh, have spiritual friends who might be able to help us. People who know us well enough and people whose intentions is really based in the path and who we could ask this kind of advice to. Where might I be stuck in my spiritual path? What are the ways I keep retracing the same thing? Very hard to do, even with close friends. Um, I also, when I was thinking about this chapter and, and the exposing of faults and really a teacher who points out your faults, I was thinking about this definition of you know, life as teacher or life as guru. And we often say that in a kind of... Um, a romantic way, right? Oh yeah, life is such a great teacher or they're my teacher when we talk about someone who's hard, right, for us. Um, but if we really take that to be honest to ourselves, it's interesting. What part of life do we feel is our teacher? Meaning what part of life is helping us see the ways that we still need to wake up? The things were stuck. So maybe you got a little like hint of this in our self-compassion practice, whatever kind of came up when we were thinking about what's hard to be with. But I'd be curious for us to consider this, like what part of life is our teacher? This changes over the years, right? So it could be right now, my teacher is work. Man, I just... You know, don't know how to set boundaries. I'm just working too much. And then life becomes our teacher. And what is it showing us? Well, we have to dig. But what we might be able to see is, gosh, I, I have so much pride tied up in my work that I, I can't just let it be good enough. And it's wearing me down. And so we can start to like pull apart maybe some of these tendencies or habits where we see something that in life that we're having difficulty with, we can find a way to use that as our teacher, as our mirror, right? And um, so I'd be curious, does anything come up for folks? Is there anyone who's like, oh, I know what my teacher is right now through life. There's this thing, it's really showing up for me. Yes, please, Michael. Um, it's partly because of your experience, but um, for me, sometimes when I get sick, is a teacher for me. Um, and I had COVID a few weeks ago, and um, uh, apart from feeling sick, I think it opened to me just to step outside of myself. I wasn't that sick. Um, but I had the symptoms and then I've had all the stories mm. of the people who've been very sick and have died mm. over the last couple of years. And it really, it, it gave me the opportunity to open my heart that that was what happened because I got it, you know, like, okay, breathing, um, mm. all of those things, you know. But yeah, that that I think sometimes for me, that a sickness can can be a challenge because at that point, 
I start feel sorry, feeling sorry for myself. Yes. Um, um, you know, the whole deal. And um, just learning to watch that and um, uh, seeing what I can learn from it is, is, uh, can be interesting. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yesterday was like, I don't, I haven't heard of this as a term, but um, my serious like COVID grumpy. Um, and it was like, I, f I had to try to be gentle with myself because I felt like I was being like a, like a petulant child. Just like, I don't want to be sick anymore. And like this, uh, like just this real, like, and just like being like frustrated. And I was like, wow, this is certainly not helping anything. And just, you know, it is, <clears throat> it is, um, it is interesting to use, you know, again, these experiences in our life as mirrors um, and help us see. Stephen Levine, who wrote, you know, the beautiful book, A Year to Live, he invited us to, whenever we feel sick, imagine we're dying and just use it as this teaching of what would it be like if you were not going to get better? And I can't even go there. It's interesting. You know, I'm like, no, 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 I'm getting better. Like it's, there's so much resistance for, you know, and, and then that kind of entitlement to being healthy. I really also saw for me with, with COVID, I had a pride in being healthy. I thought like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm healthy. I'm not going to get it. And then I got like really sick. So not only like, you know, people have these mild cases. I was like, oh yeah, I'll get a mild case. <laughs> like, no. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for sharing that with us. Anybody else? An area where they're really seeing their teacher helping, helping them see these faults. Faults, let's just, let's start just like one pause moment. Really don't like this word fault. I, when I think about the word fault in the context of San Andreas, as in a place <laughs> that's like vulnerable to movement, okay, okay. But like fault, like there's something wrong with my character. I don't know if it's a helpful term. So I'm thinking of it as like a fault line. And again, I don't really know what a fault line means, but my intuitive understanding of that is a place that's prone to movement, right? Where things can get upset and disturbed. So if we think about it that way. I'll say something, Eve. Yeah. Can you, you all can hear okay? Yes. Okay. So for me, yeah, the word fault when you read it, because you know how I feel about some of these old texts, um, I got all prickly. But I like the, I like what I'm working with right now, or what my teacher, what I'm working with my teacher, the teacher of life right now is all the ways I defend and protect myself. Hmm. And so maybe the fault for me, the faults are my old, old, outdated modes of defenses and protections. Hmm. That at one time were developing for, you know, for necessity and by a child, right? Like, and that now are not really skillful or useful um, and so one of those defenses and protections is just like this idea you know the, like this idea of how things should be yeah and it's just like fury and despair when they're not that way mm. right so like a lot of despair lately about what's happening politically and climatically in our in the world and country and then also just seeing that like my own conditioning, my personal conditioning, and then my conditioning as a white upper middle class, well, from a white upper middle class, well-educated family has been like this conditioning of really intense narrowness. Hmm. Things should be comfortable and easy. Like I was, I've been told that my entire life, everybody in my family, every single person in my family for as many generations as I know about can tell, from when we immigrated from Europe. So that is separate, but like was taught that they should have comfort and ease at every moment. Yeah. And so like really just like, oh, there's a defense and a protection and that is not an entitlement. It's just like, that's a, that's a like, that's a protection and it's a defense. Hmm. And so just like working with that, sometimes working with that can get me out of despair 
Hmm. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, that's just so like all these defenses and protections are my teachers right now because they are um, fucking me up. Like they're not, they're defending and protecting something. They're defending and protecting the misery in also, right? Like there's, they're stopping a flow. There's not an exchange. Right. So the impermanence of misery or suffering I'm not experiencing it as much because I'm so protected and defended. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yes. I, I think I, um, there's a lot of richness in there too because I think as you're saying, um, the defense gets in the way of your spiritual progress, A, because it's not accepting and then also it's, it's hurting, right? So there's almost like a foundational level, wow, this is just, like it's, uh, creating more suffering, right? That's the kind of layer of suffering um, that we can work with and that we have some ability to shape. And then how it gets in the way of our spiritual progress, I think is really interesting. Um, do you have a hit on that? Like, how is it in the way of, of spiritual progress specifically? There's some story in my head that is going to be articulated not well, but that like the privilege and advantage that I grew up with means that I should be miserable mm -hmm. until every other being has like is like there's some kind of way that my defended and protectiveness thinks that if I have any joy or like that that's um, it's illegal until everybody can have freedom and mm. grace. Yeah, so I know that 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 there. I, I know that that's a weird big picture thing, but it actually it works on like a granular level with me. That somehow the psyche believes that being miserable and suffering is the spiritual path. Right. Does that make like that? That yeah. I that I'm like you know the Mary Oliver program that I'm like home. I'm on my knees crawling through the gravel you know, for thousands of miles repenting, you know, the wild geese poem, you know? Yeah. And it's like, the knees are bloody and raw and to the bone and the repenting is like endless and there's no, there's no, there's no there there. Right. And so the real yeah, work of- Because I am not at all, but- And then so like the, the work of like ongoing transformation for the sake of all beings actually gets like thwarted Yes. in some way because the reality is right we have to enjoy what we can enjoy in a healthy way to keep our tank filled up to keep going yeah and when anybody meets me and i'm like oh my god have you read the news like i'm not being of service when i you know like when i talk to people all my friends i'm like oh my god this is like the five fucking insane horrible things i read today that's not actually being of service i'm just bringing more shitty news to people who already read shitty news. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This way it dims the light. It definitely dims the light. Yeah. Yeah. And it's that um, empathic distress in the way of empathic concern. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, that's, you know, I'd say that's like a really precise seeing of this, um, this habit mace, you know, like it's beautiful. And like, again, it's, I, I feel like one other piece is if we treat it again as, as a teacher who's like informing us, a teacher tells us of these things because they believe we can do better. They don't point out things we can't do. So I think there's, it's interesting again to kind of impose this idea of a teacher onto our everyday life events. But I think we should impose the full measure, which is that this is someone who expects you to learn and to shift and to change and to grow. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's a helpful perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise it can really feel, um, we can just find some sense of despair in it or like I, this won't change or I can't change, which can be very, <clears throat> very easy to feel. Yeah. Um, 
I'll read this little passage um, here, page 227. It says, this is Dilgo Kense Rinpoche. When a troublemaker is identified and apprehended, peace returns to the village. Similarly, when our faults are unearthed by a truly kind teacher, enabling us to recognize and eradicate them, peace returns to our being. The true spiritual teacher speaks frankly, striking at the core of our defects in order to lead us to the right path. Any other thoughts on this? I'll, I'll, I'll chime in on this one. Great. Um, I think that uh, on, the, on the upside of it, I think um, as far as the faults, I can kind of see them impersonal because I'm pretty sure everybody's got all the same ones. <laughs> You know, so there's no uniqueness there, um, which is good. And um, I think, um, you know, when I, I'm retired now, so I think maybe that's my teacher now. Mm. Um, and I have surrounded with some friends and fellowship and people that can tell me when I'm getting off the beam. But it kind of is funny because, um, you know, previously when I went to work, it was like people were telling me my faults all the time. It was all day long. I mean, hell, I just had to go to work. People, it would be no problem, you know. And I think some of the people that are with, um, you know, uh, in in uh, what do they call that? LTRs. <laughs> can say, you know, they have, you know, their partner, spouse will they'll easily tell them what, what all their faults are. You know, mm -hmm. I live by myself, so it's, it, there's nobody here to tell me. But life has a way of, um, you know, sorting things out. Hmm. You know, and I can see by my feet. And the other thing is, you know, I've had really great teachers, um, you know, to help me with those kind of defects of character. But I also have to remember that, um, you know, in the therapeutic community, uh, I think it is considered that it's kind of like a, a boundary violation to define someone else's reality. So I can't, and I've been kind of, I've had situations where I felt like someone was defining my reality about something. And it's like, wait a minute, man, no, that's not right. So it's, it pays to develop trust and time with people before you really um, feel like they have something to offer you. Yeah. Um, you know, and I kind of have to be mindful of that. And I need to just be in good enough shape, like someone else would say, to be of service to others. Yeah. You know, and not to bring, not be the bearer of bad news that they already know about, or, um, you know, I want to create an atmosphere that it's going to be, um, it's going to be cool for us and feel comfortable to share. Yeah. You know, and so, um, but these kind of discussions really help me think about, um, think about that. So thanks everybody for being here. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's true. Whoever you live with, whoever you work with, uh, there's, it's, it's easy to see that, um, reflected, but I, I, again, I know I really admire and respect the teachings and how this is laid out. Um, but I, I guess I'm just uh, a little bit of a rebel and I want us to do it. I want us to be able to identify the teachings from life and to be able to identify, you know, the teachings, uh, that we're, we're getting around us and, as community support each other in doing it. Cause you're right, it's, it's a, tr and you know, gosh, this goes wrong. Even in these ancient spiritual settings, right? And, and certainly in contemporary ones, it's a big power trip as a teacher to point out someone's faults. So you can do it with a clear heart and you can do it with such wholesomeness, but gosh, it can really go wrong, right? So I think it's, helpful to, to support each other. Nick, I really agree in this. Um, and you'll see some of, some of the ways um, that, uh, that these, these teachings are described is really the goal is to kind of um, regret what you've done, see it clearly and proclaim you'll never do it again. You know, it's this real kind of drama um, of, of this aspect of exposing faults. So, um, this one teacher here, 
This is Shaq Barr, who's, you know, he's pointing out his own defects. He's like, I'll point out my own defects as I'd remove lice with my fingers. I'll toss my defects out the door as I'd pull a thorn out of my foot and toss it away. Uh, he says uh, <laughs> about himself, this is what you are. You are a sack stuffed with the wealth of food and given by the faithful, like a, bu a bull sleeping like a corpse, a snake filled with hatred, a bird filled with desire, a pig filled with stupidity. Pigs are not stupid though. A lion filled with pride, a dog filled with jealousy, a hungry ghost filled with greed, a butcher thirsting to inflict torment, a cannibal reveling in flesh and blood. So that's the kind of level of drama going on there. Um, and, you know, yeah, it's interesting. Again, I, I, I know this is drawn from a specific cultural lineage and time. I just don't know um, if all of these things are, uh, if all of these practices would be that helpful for us. This passage ends with, um, if you have any self-respect and a heart in your chest, brains in your head and sympathy for yourself, regret your past actions, improve your whole behavior. Now is the time, it's already getting <laughs> late. And then it says, see how all that is born dies. All that is hoarded runs out. All that is gathered gets separated. And all, absolutely everything is without essence. Meaningly, meaningless activity should be abandoned to practice the essential and divine Dharma. I re, uh, my past actions were wrong. I regret them from the core of my heart. I confess them and promise to never commit them again. So that's the kind of, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Again, it's, it's, an, it's, it's, it's drama in its own way. So where's the self-compassion? Yeah, <laughs> it's in the regret and the confess. Um, I think again, the baseline here is, is there's so much kind of steeping in, we're at part four, there's a steeping into recognizing our basic goodness. So we're not regretting, like, I'm not a bad person. Um, and then we're, but we're regretting our actions or our past actions. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, nice people. Um, I, I kind of hear the, a little bit of that, what you just read and kind of just when Connie spoke for a second about self-compassion and inspired this idea that, um, I think what it, what I'm sensing is that it's saying that we we all actually are those things, whatever the um, ignorant mm -hmm. and jealous right. and uh, lazy and blah blah blah, right? Like, like actually we are. Like every single one of us, I think I can certainly relate that list. Like I am actually those things, not exclusively, right? And I think it it sort of says that too, of like, absolutely, like, so the self-compassion actually is owning that. Hmm. And being like, oh yeah, totally lazy, or totally ignorant, or I was being so uh, jealous, or uh, hmm. angry, or uh, hmm. in denial, or, or whatever, right? Like, I mean, seriously, we do do, I mean, okay, me. It's so true. <laughs> yeah. So it's so relevant when you're like, you can just be like, you have enough love for yourself. And maybe in the community setting, there's enough love in the community for you to come up and be like, yeah, I was totally lazy. Then, yeah. Or I was totally ignorant, like totally um, checked out would be a good one. Um, or I was feeling really jealous. And so I acted out. And the compassion is like that love that we have for ourselves that allows us to admit the fault. Mm -hmm. and like also the community holding, right? Cause like, uh, uh, is that Nick? Yeah. 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 Like kind of Nick was saying in that, in the therapeutic thing where like you, you have to have that sense of safety and that sense of trust and that sense of the other um, in order to be willing to admit your faults. And so, 
um, when we have a safe community and when we have a safe internal environment, we can actually admit to these things that are super true about being human. Mm. I love that. Actually. Yeah. 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 And I, I think you're, you're right. Like for sure. These teachers who are writing, they are writing, exposing their faults out of a compassion act for us. Like they are modeling, right? This behavior of recognizing when and where they fall short. And so why can't we also make it an act as we're kind of um, recognizing the limitations, right? We aren't fully awakened beings, any of us yet. So how can we be gentle um, and also figure out what's in the way? So I, I love that framing of it. And, you know, some of these are, are actually like pretty, um, I don't know the right word, but pretty beautiful. Uh, there's a, a series by Patrick Rinpoche um, and he describes the ways that we can fall into kind of spiritual torpor. So the words here are, <clears throat> the first time I met my master, I felt that all my wishes had been fulfilled like a navigator who comes upon an island of pure gold that is called taking the meaning of the teachings to heart. Later, when I arrived in the presence of my master, I had a feeling of guilt, like a thief who meets a judge. That is called being brought to order. Now, when I visit my master, I am hardly more impressed than a pigeon nesting in a temple. I feel like I'm meeting an equal. That is called turning your back. So it's like really interesting, like ways of looking at how we can almost get kind of apathetic to what we at first cherish and love. So I'll read just a couple more. The first time I received spiritual instructions, I was eager to implement them like a starving man seeking food. This is called appearing to practice. Later, <laughs> when I listened to the teachings, I was prey to great uncertainty. Like when you hear someone talking a long way off, that is what is called not having clarified one's doubts. Now, when I listen to the instructions, I have a feeling of repulsion as if I was forced to eat my own vomit. That is called losing the urge to ask for teaching. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, you know, it's really um, like, really especially this specific passage it's it's pages and pages long it's a really interesting uh, psychological portrait of kind of how our mind can become like so close to things that are good for us or and then we can still turn away from it like we can still find a way um to get lost or to get removed or separate ben, I saw, ben has his hand up yeah i saw that he put it down. Still want to still get something in the chat too. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Well, my, my I was snide remark with the seed of truth in the chat <laughs> and then, um, uh, very, very contemporary remark, I guess I might say. Um, okay. Well, um, I was, I was going to say, um, oh, I don't, I can't, I, I couldn't actually, I don't have high resolution on, on the, the in-person center, but I think it was Pamela who said just now about uh, mm, all the things, all all the all the wonderful and and uh, sort of things that humans can be, and that's really great. I have a, a maybe complimentary thing that also is uh, has been really important for me is um, mm, so I really got tuned into this when. Mm, when doing mm, social justice work, I guess. Uh, I don't think of, uh, you know, I kind of hear some of these mm, older passages as like, I'm going to cast aside my defenses. I'm going to just stop being a defensive person. And that is, uh, for me personally, I found that to be an extremely unhelpful standard that I sort of mm, held myself to because of my conditioning, I guess. 
And nowadays, when I try to become more understanding of other people and perspectives, I bring my defenses with me because uh, they need to be soothed so that I can be available to be of service. So if I were to try to pluck defenses out of my, you know, uh, out of my hair like a like like a louse or whatever, like that would actually really just be pretending that I don't have feelings of being threatened and, and mm -hmm. defense that like, mm, I'm sort of, a, a <laughs> through, through sort of mm, self-compassion, self-understanding, that kind of thing, I can become an expert on uh, sort of helping myself feel safe enough and knowing my, mm, my tendencies to like be of the best service that I can. So mm -hmm. I'm into acknowledging my own defensiveness and bringing it into the room and, uh, and working with it. I like, I like that. I think that's an upgrade, right? Of taking what works and applying it. And it's not, you know, I appreciate you saying that Ben, because I think the reason I had a hesitation with this chapter and didn't want to do it isn't because I'm not you know, I, I think it's important work, but for most of us, it's piling on what we're already doing all the time in, in ways that can feel unhelpful. And so that's why I, I completely agree, bringing it with self-compassion. Um, I think it's, it, it needs to be explicit um, as we do this work. And the reality is, um, this is just great. It's great training because whether we're doing this, you know, explicitly in, in our spiritual path, that spiritual path is a path of transformation. And it means that a lot of our faults are things that um, are hard to see, like Mace was describing, ways that we've, you know, um, ex experienced and kind of um, taken down ideas, conditioning from culture, whether biases or prejudice, um, things that we would you know rather not look at? Oh, I don't want to see that. I don't want to know it. It's hard. Like we have to. Um, there's no question. And so if we need to, you know, find a way to liberate all beings, we have to find a way to be with our own faults. <laughs> we really do, right? It's a non-negotiable part of the path. Uh, and so finding a way, I think, as I hope we're doing tonight together. You know, like it's such a key part. Yes, we need to do some of this on our own and together. So, yeah. Well, we got through at least the first couple pages. I, I regret to inform you, we probably have a couple more weeks of exposing our faults ahead. So, but there's some, there's some good parts. We'll, I'll be eager to see how Chandra wants to handle it. Um, but let's give ourselves a moment to come back into practice set our dedication together. Taking a moment to connect to the body and the breath. And returning just for a moment, just kind of refreshing our mind with the preciousness of practice as human life. understanding the impermanence of even our time here together. Noting that everything we are doing, engaging with, has an important impact. Navigating ourselves towards the impact that is meaningful. Together, we dedicate the merit of this class, meaning if anything that we have been doing together has generated an energy that is of benefit and beautiful, we can imagine that extending and expanding out, that some small part of what we do today can connect to networks and networks and networks, systems and systems and systems radiating out so that all beings could know ease and peace, 
so that all beings could sense belonging and safety. So that all beings could be held on their path to awakening. Thank you, everyone. Really great to be together tonight. Stay healthy or continue on the healthy return. For other you forms. too, feel better. Thank you. Recover thank you. soon. Thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you. by the way, I am teaching online Friday for Vinny for Big Heart uh, City. Big Heart City, which I think is also at seven. Um, and I'm gonna be returning to the theme of uh, joy and fear uh, that Ryan and I covered a couple weeks ago. It just was, feels uh, really rich. So if you wanna come or let other folks know, that'll be- How do you hook up to that? I mean- That's a good question. Big Heart City. Big Heart City online. 30, not seven, if I recall correctly. Oh, what time? let me look. Big heart. Be good for me to, to sign to go to the right time for sure.